for joining us for today's YP Speaks Google Hangout. Uh, I'm Jordan Jarvis, the Executive Director of the Young Professionals Chronic Disease Network, and YP Speaks is a live Google Hangout webinar series hosted by the network where our members can share and discuss their work, knowledge, and experiences on topics related to non-communicable diseases and their impact on global health, development, and implications for economic and social justice. We're a global community of over 2,000 young professionals and students from fields of medicine, public health, economics, public policy, and more from over 120 countries who come together to address NCDs as an issue of social justice. And so today we have Joe Jewell, and Joe has been involved with YPCDN for several, several years now. Um, he's currently working as a Nutrition Policy Officer with the Division of Non-Communicable Diseases and the Life Course at the WHO Regional Office for Europe. His previous experiences include roles as Policy and Public Affairs Manager at the World Cancer Research Fund International, based in London, and as Policy Coordinator at the European Public Health Alliance in Brussels. He has a background in European politics and a Master's in Health Policy, Planning and Financing, and his experience and publications mainly relate to food and nutrition policy, including a focus on effective policy design and the role of European and global recommendations. So we're very thrilled to have Joe with us today, um, and I'll hand the mic over to you, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just get my Zoom over. There we go. Uh, OK, am I live? Can everybody hear me OK? Good, OK. Um, Welcome to a very dark and grey Copenhagen. Um, it's early evening here and it's uh, pretty cold already, um, but glad quite a few of you could join um, for this presentation this afternoon on um, food policy. Um, as Jordan mentioned, I'm currently at uh, the World Health Organization Regional Office for Europe. I'm there in um, a capacity as a policy consultant. Um, Obviously, I don't represent the views of the organization when I give this presentation, and that sounds like a uh, <laughs> very sort of like um, political thing to say, but as you'll see during the presentation, I suppose that, um, you know, food policy, as with any other area of public health, is a, quite a political um, area, and, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting debates going on there. It's why I love the area. Um, so I don't, I want to bring to this presentation, to this discussion, uh, my experience as a young professional, as a, a member of the Young Professional Chronic Disease Network, more as a, in my personal capacity, really, um, to share it. Obviously, I'm going to be using some of my work experience, both with uh, NGOs and also um, currently with the WHO in these slides. Um, I don't uh, feel free to interject with any questions, and so Jordan can perhaps moderate that if there are any urgent questions about the, the content, um, but hopefully there'll be some time for questions about it. Um, so let me just try and get my slides up on the screen, if that works. Entire screen. While you do that, just want to encourage people, feel free to tweet um, ha with the hashtag YPSpeaks, and there's also a Q&A box for I see we have six viewers outside of um, the video discussion, so feel free to also ask questions in the Q&A box, and we'll definitely have a great discussion once Joe guides us through this, this talk. Okay. Is the, are the slides up on the screen now? Yep. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, I'm going to primarily be giving a, a view from the European situation, simply because that's what I know best. Um, and also it's quite interesting to take a, a regional perspective sometimes, um, but obviously much of what I, I'm going to be saying is applicable to um, more globally. I want to, so I'll take a look at some of the, the situation as concerns um, the burden of disease, uh, the levels of obesity in the region, which is one of the re primary reasons we're concerned with um, food policy, and then move on to current policy frameworks and their priorities and discuss, uh, really, this is where, when you know, we move on to the way forward for nutrition, I'm talking more in my personal capacity, but as someone with an interest in food policy, thinking which direction do we want to go, and that's particularly interesting from a young professional's perspective as well, because we're going to be the, the generation that is pushing this, this agenda forward, and we'll be really trying to sort of deal with the consequences of um, current dietary patterns and the rising levels of obesity. This is a slide you'll often see people who work in food policy using um, these days. It comes from the Global Burden of Disease study that um, was published in The Lancet 
um, a couple of years back. Um, and what it really shows is actually how important um, dietary risk factors are to, um, in terms of the global burden of disease. Um, so what you see here is that 15 out of the 20 top risk factors are somehow related to nutrition or physical activity. Notably high blood pressure at the top right there, diets low in fruit, high body mass index which is you know what we commonly know as being overweight or obese, um, high fasting plasma glucose, but then even as you go further down on the list you see more and more dietary factors, so high, diets high in sodium, salt, uh, diets low in nuts and seeds, suboptimal breastfeeding which emphasizes the importance of like, taking a life course approach too to this. Um, so what you're basically saying, and this is global, so this is not just the European region, this is globally, which shows that diet, nutrition and physical activity are extremely important um, in terms of uh, the burden of disease globally. And when you come to the European region, what you're seeing is that among adults, over 50% of the uh, population is overweight or obese, and 20% of that 50% are, are actually, no sorry, 20% of the population are actually obese. Um, and so it really it is a huge problem and the spiral graph there just shows how dominating it really is uh, as a sort of a condition in the European region. Uh, I should say we 53 countries in the European region so that stretches all the way from Ireland and the UK in the west to Vladivostok in the east um, and incorporates Central Asia as well. And some of the countries in the European region would have previously been uh, certainly experienced a double burden of malnutrition, but maybe sort of 20, 30 years ago the, the primary issue would have been undernutrition, whereas now it, we're seeing much more of a shift um, towards uh, overweight and obesity in these countries too. And it's not just restricted to um, the European region, as I mentioned. This is a slide from World Obesity, which shows um, the rates of overweight and obesity in the, um, the world as a whole, a whole. And what you see is it is very, very pervasive globally. And this is a pattern that is um, unfortunately getting worse. So this is um, for adolescents. Um, and you'll just see as I move through the slides the change in colors. So if we go back, you see it starts out in Western Europe and Southern Europe, and then it does move over into the Eastern Europe too in terms of uh, reaching high levels of BMI. So you know, this is a trend that is uh, getting worse, let's say. Um, and what we've seen is faster increases in countries, um, parts of the region where they had traditionally lower rates, um, and it's getting faster. Uh, we've measured, you know, childhood. So there's adult obesity, and then there's also childhood obesity, which is a, a major concern. And what's interesting to see is that within the European region, you see a north-south gradient. So, and um, these are countries in the Mediterranean which have traditionally had some of the healthiest diets. Um, what you see is uh, there's a description of a diet called Mediterranean diet, which has very, very strong evidence behind it that it is protective against cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and um, other chronic conditions, but actually it's those countries that are currently very far away from those diets and that the children in those countries are experiencing the highest rates of obesity. And if you go down to the sort of individual uh, nutritional risk factors, um, you start to see very, very low levels of uh, exclusive breastfeeding, which we know is the, the best possible start for the infant and can help reduce later risk of obesity. Uh, high intake across the board of saturated fats, uh, which are a risk for cardiovascular disease, um, generally inadequate um, supply of fruit and vegetables across the region, um, although some countries do have it, uh, an adequate supply, but that doesn't necessarily translate into adequate consumption, um, and salt intake as well. So WHO has a famous um, salt recommendation of uh, no more than five grams per day and no country in the region achieves that um, which is quite remarkable really uh, 53 countries no country uh, meets that and some countries have got very very high levels of salt intake you'll see there's eight up, up to 18 14 12 grams um, and there's very strong evidence of the link between salt intake and blood pressure as you may know um, and not only is this a concern in terms of health conditions, but of course there is inequalities aspect too in that we, what we identify certainly in the European region is a, a relationship between socioeconomic status and um, obesity. 
So there's higher prevalence amongst low uh, income groups, which is a sort of social equity concern. Um, and just in summary, um, we can say with quite a lot of confidence that diet is a major risk factor in Europe. So this, as I mentioned, SALT 53 countries in the region exceed the, the recommendation on saturated fat, 48 countries exceed the recommendation, and sugar. Sugar is a bit diff more difficult to, the, to measure, but what we have is uh, a, currently we have a draft recommendation to um, reduce intake of uh, to 5% of total energy intake from free sugars. Um, and what we're seeing is, uh, it's relatively hard to measure, but what we're seeing is that um, lots of adolescents are consuming um, sugary drinks in a high amount, and obviously sugary, sugar-sweetened beverages are a, a major source or the leading re uh, source of uh, free sugar intake amongst those groups. And of course, trans fats um, is also an issue as um, a major, majorly strongly linked to cardiovascular disease um, and inadequate fruit and vegetable consumption. So briefly, that was on the um, <laughs> very quick overview of the, the, the issue in terms of uh, risk factors and burden of uh, disease. I should say that 77% um, of the, the disease burden in the uh, European region is uh, related to non-communicable diseases. So that is really the primary concern um, for our region. Um, as many of you will be familiar with, we have um, global commitments. Um, notably in the field of the non-communicable diseases, there was the political declaration, the UN political declaration, which uh, has been a catalyst for greater work. That translated into the Global Action Plan for the Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases uh, that the WHO um, developed in cooperation with member states. Um, that's the blue, dot, the blue cover that you see there. And also of relevance for um, nutrition and food policy is also the um, action plan on maternal infant and young child nutrition, both of which have um, set global targets um, and indicators. So for going back to the NCD action plan, we have a target to reduce preventable NCDs by 25% by 2025. And in there is a target on um, a zero, for a zero percent increase in um, diabetes and obesity, which is a very, very challenging target actually, uh, given the existing trends. And there's also a set of accompanying targets for the maternal, infant, and young child nutrition, one relating to childhood obesity and also to uh, breastfeeding, uh, rates of breastfeeding. In the uh, European region, this translated into a um, declaration on nutrition and non-communicable diseases, um, which was adopted in 2013, which was really a, a sign that the member states were committed to exploring the issue further and to perhaps working together um, to uh, devise policy um, re responses. And as a result, this um, this September, uh, this is something I've been working on, a uh, European Food Nutrition Action Plan was adopted at our regional committee. Um, and really it's to one of the mo more comprehensive um, action plans in terms of the, the specificity of the policy recommendations, which we'll have a look at in a moment. Um, and that's a trend that we've been seeing in the area of food and nutrition that over the years since um, the first global strategy on diet and physical activity in 2004, we're seeing more specific recommendations coming out, which is an, an inevitable response, A, to the burden of disease, but B, to the amount of evidence that is now emerging around some of the policy options to respond. Um, here I've included a slide on sugar reduction, but um, this is because I'm giving a presentation on sugar reduction in a couple of weeks. But um, these are some of the policies that you'll see down the left-hand column that are, have been adopted in the uh, Food Nutrition Action Plan that are some of the sort of most commonly um, spoken about uh, policies to um, address um, the issue of unhealthy diets and obesity in Europe. So one of the, the leading recommendations, of course, is to introduce strong um, controls on marketing uh, to children. So uh, we've got very, very strong evidence that marketing to children has an impact on uh, children's food preferences, their knowledge and attitudes about food. It has an effect on their um, consumption, their snacking behavior, and also it has been possible to draw some associations with um, obesity and overweight. 
And so there's, it's one of the strongest mandates that we have is to work with member states to um, encourage them to adopt policies um, to reduce marketing of children, marketing of foods to children. Um, and specifically, uh, it's foods that are high in fat, salt, and sugar. Um, and so one of the things that uh, is ongoing is work to uh, categorize foods in that way to work out which foods shouldn't uh, be marketed to children. Uh, member states also uh, committed to explore um, the possibility of working on fiscal um, policies. Uh, so that's pr uh, you know measures to affect the the price of food uh, at point of purchase because we know that um, price of food is something that does influence consumer choice. Um, and so we what member states need to explore is you know whether or not they can introduce price policies that have the effect of increasing or decreasing the price of um, certain foods at the point of sale. Most commonly researched and also sort of considered for a policy option is, um, of course, um, attacks on sugar-sweetened beverages, given that sugar-sweetened beverages are not core, um, core foods in terms of something you, you, they don't provide much new or any nutritional value, um, and they're not, you know, they, there are close healthier substitutes. But other options, member states might explore other options, um, and there is a number of examples within the European region of countries that are, have experimented it with this. So hung, Hungary has a, a tax on a variety of foods. Um, France has a tax on fizzy um, drinks. Uh, Finland has a tax on sugar, um, although it's primarily for raising revenues um, and, and not explicitly for health. And then, of course, there's consumer-friendly front-of-pack labelling. What we know is that uh, in an era of um, quite highly processed foods, it's sometimes difficult for consumers to identify which are, are the healthier options. So say, <clears throat> say a consumer is presented with two uh, versions of lasagna or pizza, they may be quite starkly different in terms of the nutritional content. One might be very low in salt, one might be extremely high but consumers find it quite difficult to make that decision, especially given that they uh, don't spend a huge amount of time looking at the food label. So what we're also trying to explore countries is um, how uh, front of pack labeling can be made more simple and easy to understand for consumers. Um, examples exist, of course, there's uh, traffic light labeling in the UK, which color codes according to the level of the nutrient. So it's red if it's high, amber if it's medium, green if it's low. In the Scandinavian countries, they have a something called the keyhole logo, which is put on the healthier option within a category. So when a consumer sees a keyhole, they know that that's the healthier choice. Um, and then the next one is around calorie reduction and smaller portion sizes. Um, so here we have um, it's the idea that products can be reformulated. Uh, Obviously, I put this in the slide about sugar reduction, but the, of the most uh, famous example of reformulation is salt reformulation, where governments have successfully worked to reduce the amount of salt um, in foods. Um, the UK, I think I've got an example here, has actually reduced the, the population level intake of salt quite significantly. And school food policies are very, very important as well, um, because obviously schools are an area where children spend a lot of their time and also ch uh, childhood is a time when people develop their food preferences and dietary habits. So uh, by having um, standards uh, for the foods that are provided in or available in schools uh, is in a very important way. And I think the recommendation there is very strongly to have a comprehensive approach because if you're providing healthy foods in the canteen but a child can go around the corner and buy um, unhealthy items from a vending machine or from the school store, um, that's going to undermine the effectiveness of the school standards. So um, that's that's the recommendation from a school is to really have a whole a whole school whole of school food policy. Um, obviously, this is just a snapshot of some of the policies, but it gives you an idea of the things that um, are being discussed. Uh, prior to this action plan being adopted, this is the sort of extent of development. And what's interesting to note from this slide is that there's um, generally higher level of implement for policies that um, are more focused around providing information um, and uh, providing guidance um, or schools and less has been taken towards the bottom around which are the sort of more um, interventionist policies uh, like front-of-pack labeling, what is meant by signposting, 
food price uh, policies, whether that's taxes or subsidies, um, reformulation had been less implemented and marketing food to children had been um, less uh, less implemented. So that's an interesting trend. You know, countries have to date have tended to focus on policies that are more around providing information to consumers rather than changing the, the food environment as we call it. Um, Another thing that we've looked at is um, what are some of the successful nutrition policies because you know this is an area where countries are um, you know taking action but they, they they're taking action in lots of different areas but they're keen to learn from different countries. So uh, one of the examples from the European region that we often quote is um, on trans fats. So as I mentioned trans fats are very strongly associated with cardiovascular disease and can be easily um, eliminated from the food supply chain. What Denmark did as a first uh, first in the world was to introduce a ban on trans fat. So they set a maximum um, limit of trans fats in in the fat supply. So they said you can only have two grams of trans fats per 100 grams of fat, which actually virtually um, eliminates it. And almost all companies within one year were able to comply with that. And that's basically eliminated trans fats, um, which are an industrially produced um, type of fat from the food supply and that's had a significant uh, beneficial impact in Denmark. Um, Denmark has recently reported uh, reductions in um, CVD events although it's, not, it's difficult to attribute that exclusively to the, the policy on trans fats and it probably you know it's also to do with physical activity levels, smoking prevalence etc but you know one can assume that a ban on trans fats has somehow contributed. Um, in terms of marketing of food to children, um, we're, we're doing some work, WHO is doing some work on um, a nutrient profile model, as a, which is a way of categorizing foods um, according to uh, whether or not they can be marketed or not marketed to children, um, which has been a very lengthy exercise, but hopefully it'll be a useful tool for member states. Um, we've seen quite a bit of action in the area of food marketing to children. Um, although there's still room for improvement, of course, uh, worldwide, only three countries in the world have um, statutory restrictions on food marketing to children. Um, most of that focuses on TV advertising alone, and what we know is that TV advertising is only one form of um, marketing communication when you consider sponsorship, product placement, online marketing, um, yeah, I mean, it, in-store promotions, um, the the amount of uh, avenues for marketing these days is so extensive that policies really need to be much uh, broader if they're adequately going to restrict the amount of marketing. Um, so that's one area where hopefully more work will come in the coming years. Um, salt reduction is, is an area, of course, where there has been quite a bit of success. Um, notably in the UK, but lots of countries have done it, uh, and Finland. Um, they need to be more expanding to more products. So a lot of countries have started with bread, um, which is important because bread is a food that is consumed often, uh, and so can be a major source of, uh, of salt in the diet, um, although it's impossible to achieve the types of reduction that we need to reach the 5 gram um, intake level by reducing uh, salt in bread alone, it needs to be a much broader uh, range of products. Um, but it's interesting to note when you're talking about reducing salt intake, in the European context, um, the vast majority of salt comes from processed food. So whereas in some contexts you might be talking about trying to reduce uh, the amount of salt that people add to their food, in the European context and in many other um, regions of the world, it's talking about reducing the amount of salt in processed food. Um, I think it's worth talking about uh, why there has been some limitations in the amount of policy development, um, particularly given that um, the food policy area or, or the, the evidence on food is quite difficult. Um, what is often the challenge is that there's no evidence that the relationship is causative. Um, so, you know, what they say is uh, you can't show that it is um, food marketing that is causing obesity. Um, or you can't show that it is um, this nutrient in particular, uh, taking an example of sugar for example, you can't say that it's sugars that are causing obesity as opposed to any other um, 
nutrients. So that's been challenging because it's put the bar very, very high for um, epidemiologists and other public health experts in terms of analyzing and communicating the evidence. Um, and what they say is actually there are some other factors that are more important in influencing diets and obesity, such as education, um, parenting, etc., uh, rather than changes the food industry might make. Um, when it comes to marketing, the evidence is dismissed um, because they say, well, actually, children understand marketing. But um, And then there's also the role of government um, issue around proportionality and uh, whether a policy is paternalistic, um, freedom of choice, etc. cetera, um, whereas people might actually argue that um, public health policies are empowering and provide people with the choice. Um, and then there's also the economic, um, the economic aspect. Um, I'm just, I won't read these out for want of time, but um, I've included in the slide some of the examples that you find when uh, you review uh, submissions from industry on, um, on things like marketing to children. So this one is from the Grocery Manufacturers Association, and it was submitted um, to the US um, DA, I think it was, um, or the FDA, um, when they were considering food marketing to children policies. And it is, this one is coming around um, the fact that you, you can't conclude that marketing is the primary force causing obesity in children and adolescents, and from that they conclude that there's uh, no need to take action. Another one from um, another organization that I can't remember um, noting, but um, says you also, the policy evidence is not there. So basically they're saying you can't, you can't tell us what you're expecting from the policy. Um, and therefore it's disproportionate um, and fails to support the proposal. So these are some of the things, the challenges that governments have to um, address when developing policies, uh, especially, you know, consider a government that wants to introduce something as a world first. You don't have evidence that it is going to be effective. You just simply can't. But what you can d demonstrate is that uh, you've identified what the de determinants of the behaviors are and you've d identified how certain uh, environmental factors influence people's purchasing, their consumption and their overall diet um, and therefore you've designed a policy that should uh, respond to that um, and that's you know what you can often do in the the, um, the first line of call and of course um, many policies introduced as well have been um, only part you know they're not fully comprehensive, they have some gaps in them, etc., which might explain as well why you're not seeing the results that you expect to see. You know, often you'll see um, from uh, food industry, uh, people working in marketing, they say, oh, well, you've introduced um, policies in Quebec, or you've introduced policies in Sweden, uh, and there's been no effect on childhood obesity, um, therefore the policy doesn't work. And actually, what it's important to do is analyze, well, why might it not have worked? In the UK, the TV um, advertising restrictions, um, as I said, they only focused on TV advertising, so they didn't reduce other forms of marketing. And what you also found is that there was somehow a squeezed balloon effect, whereby during the times that the advertising was restricted, the amount of advertising did go down, but either side of the restrictions, it went up. So children's total exposure didn't really go down because they were still watching either side of the, the restrictions. Um, and so that is, you know, that's an explanation for why you may not have been seeing this type of effect. And then that's before you even consider the whole thing that obesity is not, has multiple causes, uh, there are multiple influences on people's diets, so you actually wouldn't expect a poli one single policy in isolation to have an effect, you know, a significant effect given that you should be looking for a comprehensive response. So, um, yeah, I mean, here it's a really a sort of like um, a question of opportunities and threats. You know, how do we, um, how do we respond and how do we design policies that are going to be effective? This is just something I wanted to hear. So obviously you've just seen some of the policy recommendations that were included in the WHO documents. But other people are working on this, of course, as well. And the civil society organizations have been very instrumental in calling for um, more policies and more effective policies um, in the area of food and nutrition. This slide here is taken from uh, World Cancer Research Fund. Um, I should, <laughs> I should accept, you know, sort of like admit that um, I was involved in developing this, so I have some sort of bias. 
But I think it's a very nice um, a way of communicating some of the policies that you want to see. So the acronym is Nourishing Down the Side. And this was, in a way, inspired a, a bit by the tobacco uh, control experience, where they had a very, very clear set of policies um, that they were going to implement. Um, and that everybody knew these are the policies that you implement in order to address um, tobacco smoking. Uh, and in the area of food um, and nutrition, often um, people say, oh, we're not quite sure what to do. Uh, so this this was motivated by a, a need to have um, a more concrete set of like, recommendations. And then, of course, um, here again, speaking in personal capacity, uh, it's worth noting that there have been discussions around um, whether or not you need a framework convention on obesity, given that you have a framework convention on tobacco that has been extremely effective in encouraging um, wider implementation of effective policies. Um, and actually, what's interesting about the Tobacco Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is that um, it actually encouraged uh, people and governments to develop policies even before the Framework Convention had been adopted because they were aware it was coming and also they had been engaged in the discussions around the policies that were going to be part of the Framework Convention. So it had that um, effect even before it had been adopted. So World Obesity Federation and Consumers International, two leading uh, civil society organizations in the world, have called um, for the development of a, um, a global convention to protect and promote healthy diets. Um, and also the Lancet has called for a framework convention on obesity for the three reasons um, set out here, uh, that you need government leadership, business as usual will be costly, and that a systems approach is needed. Um, and this stems from the perception, of course, that government's reactions has been um, less than adequate and uh, it's also traditionally relied heavily on self-regulation by the food and beverage industry. Um, and so this is why, you know, some people have argued that it might be necessary because um, you need more implementation of food policies, that uh, it needs to have a comprehensive focus and so not just subsets, uh, but actually a comprehensive approach that takes into account all the, the necessary components um, and that it moves away from education and information approaches alone um, and that actually encourages implementation because you also see examples of countries where policies have been developed but they've not then been implemented. Um, here are some examples of policies that have been either rejected, not implemented, or overturned. So the saturated fat tax in Denmark is, is one that has been was um, abandoned. Um, restrictions on food marketing to children in Brazil, France, and Norway were unsuccessful or significantly weakened. Uh, the New York City portion size restrictions on soda is an example of a policy that didn't manage to get through. Uh, and in the US, certainly, there's many, many examples of states that have tried to push for soda taxes and uh, clear front of, pack of lab front of pack labeling in the EU, Ecuador, and Australia have been, have been uh, not successful. But then some other critics commenting on the, uh, not critics, but people commenting on the idea of a framework convention are saying, well, it's going to be more complex because food is, um, is more difficult than tobacco. There's many more ministries involved. There's many more issues. Uh, you know, food as such is not a bad thing. You have to define which foods you're talking about. And of course, you've also lost the surprise element that caught, that, uh, caught the tobacco industry off guard. Um, and also, in a time of economic restraints, you're, there are opportunity costs in focusing limited resources on one particular issue. Other people, other lawyers have called for a UN framework convention on global health that covers all of the issue. Um, and then other lawyers have said, well, international law may be vague on specific commitments, um, and so it's hard to enforce um, and difficult to update, and perhaps it might be better to focus on wider implementation of individual sort of, of policies at, uh, at the individual country level. I, I don't have an opinion on this uh, that I'm able to share, but, but I think this is an interesting point to, um, for discussion. Um, and it just shows the sort of evolution of um, the discussions around food policies that we're now reaching a point where we have a very a much clearer set of recommendations and now it's talking about well what's the best way of getting them implemented. Um, I think on that note I'll, I'll wrap up from my end um, and I'm happy to ask any questions uh, that people may have uh, on that. So I'll hand back to Jordan. 
Do we have questions from our participants on the call? Jared, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, thank you, first of all, for um, having me here. Um, my name is Jared. Um, my background is in food science. I yep. graduated from UC Davis. I'm currently a master's in global health student at Duke University. Um, I'm taking a non communicable disease class, and um, right now we're actually covering food industry's impacts on NCDs. Um, so there's very complex issues. You went through a lot of good points. Um, in particular, I'm interested in the soda tax. And um, I know it's implemented in Norway and Denmark um, and other countries like Mexico, also um, parts of the US like New York. I was wondering what the barriers are towards other countries that maybe um, why it hasn't been implemented. Um, I know like Norway and Denmark are a little wealthier, so I'm wondering if there's been opposition to, or just like the, the other side of the story on uh, maybe in England or other countries that haven't imposed the tax. Yeah. Um, shall I speak? Yeah. Um, I think uh, that's a really good question, and I, I think it is an uh, issue that's going to come up more and more. Um, I think now it's recognized that there is a need to explore price policies more, and countries are recognizing that. Um, and as you said, and I said in my presentation, there are examples of a, numer a few countries that have gone ahead and done it. I think the limit, the barriers to countries doing it um, in the first place was, uh, again, this sort of vicious circle of, well, there's no evidence that has a real impact in the world. You know, someone said, well, there's no country that's done it yet, and we can't show that it's ha had an effect. Uh, where, you know, in the States, for example, lots of states do uh, levy taxes on sodas, but it's as a revenue-raising um, tool, and it's not levied at a high enough rate that you would expect it to have an impact on consumption anyway. You know, what the evidence says is you have to levy a tax on a, at a certain level in order for it to affect people's consumption or purchase. Um, and so we're now moving to, and so often what you hear is from countries saying either we're not sure of the evidence or there isn't any evidence that it works. But now a couple of countries have decided to go ahead. In many cases, the motivation has been revenue raising. But what they've done is they've recognized that there are benefits. There's co-benefits. So we are raising revenue, but you also will be able to perhaps change behavior. And so we're, I think this is a really important um, example of the need to monitor the effects of policy. It is really, really important and that a country, when they introduce a policy, they measure at the baseline and they also set uh, you know, indicators to measure over time to say, well, what is the impact going to be? Um, we're about to publish um, a paper in the coming weeks or months about um, price policies using the examples from within the European region, looking at the effects. And I think you know they, they are having anticipated effects on consumption in line with what the economic theory would suggest and also what the public health evidence suggests. I mean, the public health evidence looks at experimental studies, so you've got sort of experiments in laboratory settings or in in um, canteens or you know in fixed environments and they say that if you change the price it does change consumers um, uh, purchasing decisions and then there's also economic modeling which suggests that it would have an effect too and you've also got some longitudinal studies that show if you change price the population has changed its purchasing so there's quite a body of evidence that says it probably should work and now we're going to hopefully complement that with some examples from countries saying, yeah, it is actually having a, an effect too. So hopefully we'll move. And also Mexico, big, of course, being the big example, there's a huge amount of scrutiny over Mexico <laughs> to see what's going to happen. And uh, hopefully hopefully we'll see some results. Great. Anyone else on the call here have a question? All right. There's a question in the Q&A. Um, from Katrina White Cabbage. Hello, Joe. The information you presented on the EU dietary trends is really interesting. In developing countries, the expanding economies are a major contributor to the increase in unhealthy dietary choices. What is driving the trend in Europe? Um, yeah, I mean, it's always a very difficult question to answer. Um, but there are a lot of factors um, in terms at play, really. And um, global trade policies have changed 
Um, the production of food has changed. The uh, the nature of the food supply chain in terms of the number of actors that are operating along it has changed. Um, the ability of um, food companies to create new products that are highly profitable, which means that they can also invest that money in food marketing, uh, has also changed. And so basically what you're seeing is that the, the you know, the globally the types of uh, foods that are available has shifted. So when, whereas primarily and previously we were consuming uh, staple foods, whole grains, fruit and vegetables, uh, actually the availability of foods that are not that, so that are highly processed or meats, refined um, uh, cereals, um, has increased uh, exponentially. And um, I mean, globalization is a big term, but there are you, what you do see as well is um, that trade policies have facilitated the entry into new markets of um, globalized companies um, who offer, um, you know, the same similar sorts of foods. Uh, they may be adapted slightly to new markets. Um, and again, they're using similar promotional tactics um, in order to create a market. So. I think that is, in a nutshell, why we're seeing some of the trends that we are seeing um, in Europe and, and worldwide. But it's a tough question. I can send you some papers if you want to follow up with me. Um, there's no other questions from the participants. I'll just take another here from Anthony Saxton. Uh, is there a policy we can implement to prohibit misleading statements appearing on food packages? For instance, this weekend I saw a package of fruit roll-ups with the label high in vitamin C, implying this junk food is actually healthy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's one of the areas that is um, particularly, has been particularly difficult. Um, it, there's a, I can send you, um, the US is a particularly good example, but there, in, in the EU there is actually a, a, a regulation on the use of uh, nutrition and health claims um, on food products um, whereby, if, and it's been an absolutely huge mammoth task, where, whereby the European Food Safety um, Authority has ha had to review each and every claim um, that the industry would like to put on their foods uh, and they've had to substantiate it. Um, uh, interestingly, alongside this, there was supposed to be something called a nutrient profile model, which would say, okay, so we've got all these claims, these are the approved and accepted claims, uh, and then you have a nutrient profile model that categorizes foods, again, as according to whether they are uh, more healthy or less healthy. And if they were more healthy, they could bear a claim. If they were less healthy, they wouldn't be able to have any claim at all, um, irrespective of whether the claim was true, simply because they were less healthy. Um, unfortunately, that, that nutrient profile model hasn't been uh, developed or adopted yet, um, which is hindering the full implementation of that policy. But yeah, nutrition and health claims is a really important area. And there, there can be a policy, but it's a difficult one to get through. <laughs> Do you have uh, time for two more questions, Joe? Yeah, sure. Great. Jared, you want to go ahead? Hi, uh, sorry. Um, I was just kind of wondering, um, in the U.S. there's a big talk about gen genetically modified foods, uh, and then organic is also, and all, all natural are different claims that manufacturers put on the label. Um, they're not very well governed in the U.S. There's not a clear definition. Um, there's a lot of gray area. Um, I'm looking at Europe, and it seems like a little more strict in terms of uh, even genetically modified foods. I was wondering how like organic, all natural, um, genetically modified free foods how that kind of shapes the obesity um, impacts that um, food companies have too. Um, because you have, yeah. I'm going to give you a very short answer in that I'm not someone who's particularly well versed in sort of issues around GMO um, or organic foods. Uh, what I would say is that, of course, coming from a nutritional perspective, um, uh, yeah, I haven't done food safety on GMO, so I'm not going to talk about that. But also, from a nutrition perspective, we can we're concerned about the nutritional value of foods, and you know, plenty of organic foods are healthy, but plenty of organic foods may be unhealthy too, right? <laughs> so um, it's like where you also have uh, an interesting relationship with agricultural um, community or agricultural in, um, ministries, for example, who say, well, the, we're promoting traditional foods, um, 
and you do have to say after a while, well, not all your traditional foods are that healthy. Um, of course, when you come back to it, it is part of a um, it is part of a, a whole diet approach, and you know many traditional foods can be consumed as part of a healthy diet. But um, yeah, <laughs> if you have to be blunt, you know it, there is an issue to be, you need to be aware of. Of course, the traditional value, but also the nutritional value of foods. Great. One more question, and then we should probably wrap up. Yeah. Is what do you think the role of the food industry should be in improving healthy food behaviors? Um, that that's also a very tricky question, uh, but something that comes up a lot in um, our work. Um, I think there is a leading role to be played by governments. Um, in addressing the obesity crisis um, and I think sometimes um, the role of governments hasn't been as strong so I think there's plenty of room for governments to step up and um, create that leadership, set the frameworks in which um, policies are developed um, and also stay um, separately from, um, uh, you know, sort of maintain that policy making, um, decision making process separately from uh, the consultation with the food industry. I think in certain areas there is a um, opportunity to engage with the food industry, like in salt reformulation um, has been an area where governments have been able to set the framework and say this is the direction we want to go, we're going to engage with you to see what your challenges and problems are, but um, you, uh, these are the targets and let's work together to see how we can achieve them. So there are areas where their uh, engagement is possible, but I think there does need to be that um, separation between policy making and implementation. Great. Thank you so much, Joe. I think you've given us a really excellent overview of, um, of food policy in Europe and more widely across the globe and with some of the tensions um, that we face uh, with industry and, and touching on trade policies as well. And we hope to continue this discussion. Um, you can find Joe on Twitter and, uh, and the Young Professionals Chronic Disease Network. Our handle is at NCD Action. Um, so please continue this discussion with us. Joe, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. You too. Bye, everyone. Bye.